Hi, I'm Claire Southerton and I'm a postdoc in the Vitalities Lab in the Centre for Social Research in Health and the Social Policy Research Centre at UNSW Sydney. So today I'm talking about using YouTube videos as qualitative research data. So we're talking about YouTube in this YouTube video, so it's going to get pretty meta. Let's get started. You probably know what YouTube is because you're on it right now, but it's been around for quite a while, um, since 2005, and it's a real staple of how we understand and experience the web today. Certainly it's one of the most popular platforms on the internet, if not the most. The way it works is, as you'll be able to see from looking around at the platform you're on right now, is that the creators can upload videos, watch videos, comment on them, like subscribe to the channel that they're um, of another user and interact through the comment function. If you look around right now, you'll see that there are video recommendations that are personalized based on your viewing history and that the video um, will, a video will load next to the one that you're looking at right now. So the platform kind of tries to encourage you to keep, keep watching. There's an enormous amount of content on YouTube that covers almost every conceivable topic from soothing sensory videos of people cutting up soap to extreme right-wing conspiracy theory rants, which frankly, I don't find soothing at all. Given this huge amount of content, there are also countless communities that form um, around the specific kinds of content or specific creators. And some of them are much more loosely connected than others. And some of them are really kind of concretely connected. So um, YouTube is an enormous space. Um, filled with really, really diverse um, content and communities. So there's clearly a lot that social researchers would find fascinating about YouTube. So YouTube is a diverse platform and we need to be specific about what kinds of videos and what communities we're interested in. But when we analyze YouTube, it's also important to be precise about what constitutes our empirical material, given the platform is much more than the videos themselves. What I mean to highlight is the videos are embedded in complex social interactions and networks that extend beyond the video content. So what precisely are you analyzing when you examine YouTube videos? Are you seeking to focus on the video, video's content, its style, language, music, or themes? Are you focusing on specific creators as case studies, examining their profiles or their brand, their fans? Are you focused on audience responses? in which case you may be looking at the comments section, which would require an even more careful ethical approach. Or perhaps you wanted to consider the sensory experiences a video may elicit in a viewer. So then you may be conducting an autoethnographic study attuned to the sensations elicited in viewing the videos. Or perhaps your analysis is examining the communities constituted by videos as well as the, their creators and audiences. So if this is the case, perhaps then you need to become more finely attuned to the community and the kind of specific languages and subcultural references that they use. If you're interested in these communities, you may wish to consider content that moves across multiple platforms, not just on YouTube. Or perhaps you might be interested in the platform practices and policies. So if you're interested in these things, YouTube has a large library of policy documents that they make available and these change often and these are also are accompanied by public statements that YouTube puts out on their blog that relate to policy changes so there are different elements that make up the platform of YouTube that might become empirical material for your study and your research project may bring in several of these elements together so given all the different empirical material on YouTube there are a few different approaches you could take this isn't an exhaustive list, of course, and you may want to combine some of these approaches to build a more flesh out project, depending on what your project aims to do. So you might develop case studies of specific accounts, communities, or trends, and these could be more holistic than just the videos themselves. So they could include interactions between users or the way different videos respond to each other. Or you might do content analysis of a selection of videos and that may be based on search terms or creators or a period of time or any number of factors. You might do a network analysis, tracing the connections between different actors in the community or around a topic or during a period of time. You could also use elements of autoethnography, drawing on self-reflection and personal experience, either by participating on the platform as a creator and being active in the, within the communities you're interested in, or drawing on autoethnographic -ethno practice to be attuned to 
to specific things during your viewing of the videos. Many of these approaches can be captured under what John Postel and Sarah Pink call social media ethnography and fits within the larger field of digital ethnography or sometimes called virtual ethnography. There's a great literature on digital ethnography, so if you're wanting to conduct this kind of work, there are lots of resources to help you design your project thoughtfully. I think a really important part of doing this kind of work is understanding the way that social media interactions and what we tend to think of as the digital space is always intertwined with our non-digital lives. And really, those distinctions are always tricky and problematic to make, as we're always somewhat digitally connected. So what really is online and offline? As Postel and Pink put it, it's about acknowledging social media as a messy fieldwork environment that crosses online and offline worlds and is connected and constituted through the ethnographer's narrative. It's also important to understand that you may have to learn a lot about your digital community before you will be able to collect your data. Social media practices are learned, and though they may be experienced as fun and pleasurable, they are nonetheless highly developed skills. So understanding the platform cultures, the lingo and the symbols are really important to be able to best interpret the subtle cues that people in the community may use. There's some really great work that's been done on this. So for example, digital anthropologist Crystal Abaddon's work becoming immersed in a community of blog shop owners and commercial bloggers in Singapore. I've also published on this with my co-author Hannah McCann, a project we conducted on Twitter, which I'll leave a reference for at the end of this presentation. In addition to understanding the social cues of the community, it's also important to think through the affordances of YouTube as a platform. Jenny Davis has done some really great research on affordances that I highly recommend if you're interested in anything technology related. She explains that affordances refer to how objects enable and constrain. Technologies request, demand, encourage, discourage, refuse and allow particular lines of action and social dynamics. So when we're doing research on YouTube, we need to consider what the affordance of the platform are and how that context informs your research project and your findings. So how might search engine op optimization, the way that is the way that platforms like YouTube personalize search results for users, enable and constrain? What about the role of advertising on the platform and issues around what content is demonetized? So demonetization is basically when creators can't make advertising revenue on certain videos because they are deemed not appropriate for all audiences or not suitable for advertisements. It might be important for you to think about the impact of this on your data. What about content moderation and its an associated algorithmic bias? How does this enable and constrain? YouTube content is moderated using both human evaluation and automated screening, both of which can reproduce cultural biases such as racism, sexism, homophobia, and so on. What about surveillance or data harvesting? Or what about language and accessibility? Who can access the content and who can't? We also need to contextualize content on the site in light of its own history. For example, how videos conform or don't conform to the platform platform-centric genres of YouTube, a term Jean Burgess and Joshua Green used to describe genres that have become staples of user content, user-created content on the platform. So putting this all together, I'll give you an example. Let's say you're looking at videos that provide sex education content to young people. And the videos, because of their content, are likely to not able to be monetized because they use words that would automatically have them categorized as unsuitable for advertisement. So an automated screening process on YouTube would identify keywords in the videos that would make them demonetized. Thus, the platform encourages their creators to find financial support for their channels outside of YouTube's native advertising structure, perhaps through something like product placements. An existing genre of YouTube, of videos on YouTube, is the unboxing video. Um, it's a genre we might call a platform-centric genre on YouTube. So the unboxing video is one that already facilitates products to be central to the video, 
while maintaining a form familiar to the audience. So it makes sense that YouTube fosters the growth of sex education videos that use product placement through un unboxing of products that are supplied by sponsors. So you can see that understanding these conditions and the affordances of the platform is really important. It helps us paint the rich context in which these videos emerge. So let's talk ethics. Isn't public social media content just fair game? Well, no, it's complicated and for good reason. If we're gonna take the digital social world seriously, then we need to consider these interactions thoughtfully before collecting them en masse for our social research. Now I know what you're thinking. Gosh, considering these interactions thoughtfully doesn't sound like much fun. I promise you that it is fun. See, I told you it'd be fun and there's a meme. Okay, how do we do this thoughtfully? Well, luckily you don't have to reinvent the wheel. There are loads of great resources out there that can give you guidelines on how to collect your data thoughtfully. A good starting place is the Association for Internet Researchers Ethical Guidelines, and I'll leave a reference for that at the end. There's also the National Statement on Ethical Conduct in Human Research. I'll leave a reference for that at the end as well. Um, that was updated in 2018 to give some guidelines on social media content that are really helpful. Some general advice is don't assume that because something is publicly accessible that it is intended to be public. You need to look more carefully at the context to assess whether it was intended for a broader audience. For example, you may come across a YouTube video that is publicly available but only has 40 views and it might contain fairly personal content. Perhaps the creator uploaded it to YouTube for convenience to allow other family members to see it or close friends, um, but it was never intended for kind of um, broader, broader consumption by the general public. That kind of video may not be appropriate for your research. In contrast, a video with 600,000 views from a creator that has a million subscribers is likely intended to be public. Uh, but again, context is key, so evaluate these cases carefully. Anonymizing is often a good way to address concerns about privacy, um, but it's not always the way to go. Content creators on platforms like YouTube or in some other settings, like on fan fiction sites, for example, um, there are often environments where anonymizing erases the ownership that creators have over their content, and so it's not always appropriate. And when in doubt, contact your Human Ethics Research Committee for advice. So here's an indication of what the process might look like if you were doing some qualitative analysis on YouTube. You might spend some time learning the language, familiarizing yourself with the community you're interested in. Then you could take some field notes from a period of observation. Then you might use an automated web scraping tool to collect videos for analysis or identify the videos through your digital ethnography. Then you might watch and rewatch the videos to undertake content analysis to identify re relevant themes. And of course your process might look quite different. This is just an indication of what it could look like. Remember that conducting ethical research is an ongoing process. So keep issues of ethics and privacy in mind throughout your data collection process and writing up. Reflecting on whether your research does justice to your participants is important and whether it's generous to them. Additionally, with the context of a digital platform, keep in mind that participants may delete content or it may be removed by the platform for a range of reasons. If you wish to include screenshots of YouTube videos in your research findings, you'll also need to consider copyright and the privacy of the creator and any participants featured in the video. Though fair use may apply, this is not always the case in all publication settings. You also need to make sure that you adequately contextualize any screenshots that you use in your research to make sure you do justice to your participants. So you don't want to kind of take a screen grab of the most outrageous moment in a video and kind of allow that to speak for your participants, even though that doesn't necessarily represent the kind of content that they're making. And these are just some readings here that I recommend either because I use them in the talk or because they do a great job of dealing with YouTube as qualitative research data. Thanks so much for listening to this. And if you want to reach out at all, I've got my Twitter handle there. Please do get in touch if you have any questions about the talk or if you just want to talk about social media research. 
Um, and do subscribe if you want to hear more about our research at the Vitalities Lab. Thanks.